Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Hi. The Great Antidote is on a break from recording new episodes currently. In the meantime, we've handpicked these episodes for you. So sit back and relax, hop on your bike, or get out your notepad, however you enjoy your podcast. We'll catch you soon for new episodes. It is my great pleasure to talk to Aaron Ross Powell, the director and editor of Libertarianism.org and co-host of the podcast Three Free Thoughts. Aaron is one of those libertarians who makes other libertarians look good, not only because he edits their work behind the scenes, but also because he's so thoughtful that you almost forget that he's a radical visionary. Case in point, his new book, Visions of Liberty, which is what I want to talk about today. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Before we dive into what a libertarian utopia would look like, um, I want to ask you a question that I ask all my guests, which is, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? The main one, I think, would be to how properly to pronounce GIF. Uh, I don't know how to do that. It's, it's, not, it's not GIF, as lots of young people say, but it is GIF, uh, as, as specified by the creator of the image format. So that's, that's the main thing that bugs me about young people. Um, but, but on the less pedantic things, um, I think I was trying to think back to like when I was in high school and in college and, and like what I wished I knew then. Um, and there are, I mean, there are lots of like little things, but for me, I think the big thing is to more thoroughly question certainty that that when we're young, we have a tendency to deeply, deeply embrace our ideas and with a degree of confidence that is, I think, often unwarranted. Um, mm -hmm. And and then as you look back, you as our ideas change over time, um, we we learn that a lot of that confidence, you know, maybe maybe we were overconfident in our ideas. And I think that there's there's a lot of value in being confident in your ideas and there's a lot of value in being very passionate about them. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to knock that and that's like a laudable thing. But but I see a lot of young people, I see a lot of young libertarians, I see a lot of non-libertarian young people um, who are so certain of the ideas that they believe right now that they are unnecessarily dismissive of other ideas or unwilling to take the time to really explore those other and opposing ideas. And, and I think it sets back intellectual development. Um, so, so that would be the main thing. Like I said, I think I wish that when I talk to young people that you can be passionate about your ideas, but be less confident about them or more willing to entertain ideas that run counter to your own. Yeah, I think that's that's really good. I mean, more and more as I do this podcast, I kind of realize how little it is I know about even the things that I fundamentally think I agree with. And even like little things where I just have no, like it's stuff that you don't think about or you just, I don't know. But it's even like in talking to other people, I'm like, have you ever thought about this? And they're like, no, because I know what I know is right. And I'm like, hmm, let's, let's, let's all think about this other idea and kind of trying to, I don't know, devil's advocate type stuff just to see how much people think about what they're saying, what they're advocating for and kind of trying to see if like, maybe, maybe if you like come at it from a different angle, some other viewpoint makes more sense and kind of, I mean, that's part of the reason why I did this podcast was to try to introduce new viewpoints to people my age. 
So, yeah, I like your answer. Yeah, um, and I think I think too. There's, um, there's like an inner like personal side to it, which is, you know, you want to be able to explore, like you just said, you want to be able to explore other ideas because it might turn out that those other ideas are better than the ones that you hold or that they add nuance to the ones that you hold um, or that you just, you learn something that you didn't before. But I think there's also a, an external and social element to this that a lot of the problems we see in the country right now are to a great extent that the result of people being so certain of their own ideas and worldviews that they they believe that there's something fundamentally wrong with people who don't hold them. You know, so like I, every one of us thinks that the ideas that we hold are correct because if, if you didn't think that your ideas were correct, you wouldn't hold them. You know, you, mm-hmm. none of us, we don't go around saying like, I, boy, I believe a whole lot of wrong things. <laughs> so, but at the same time, if you are, if you think that your ideas aren't just correct, but are like, overwhelmingly obviously correct you know like they're they're so obviously correct that any reasonable person can see how correct they are then you force yourself into seeing anyone who doesn't hold them as necessarily unreasonable and and when you've done that not only are you cutting off listening to them so then you can't learn as much from them but you've you've pigeonholed them as being the kind of people who have something wrong with them and then they become either easier to dismiss or easier to sneer at or easier to put down, distance yourself from, and so on. And and that that increases the the camp-based thinking and the tribalism that we see. So I think it's it's both like you want to learn from other ideas, but you also want to appreciate that other people can have reasonable reasons for believing ideas that you don't necessarily think are correct. And so they can disagreement can be reasonable as opposed to kind of always seeing disagreement as unreasonable. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why we all have different beliefs, even if it follows the same train of thought, like everyone has different experiences or different influences. And that's why they took like X idea a different way than you did, or why they believe that the right solution to like Y problem is something else. Like, I think, yeah, I'd say it's really important to think about like, why is it that so many different people believe there are different solutions than what I think is right? I don't know. Yeah. So now let's talk about your new book, Visions of Liberty, which you co-edited with your colleague, Paul Matsko, and published at the Cato Institute. It covers a lot of topics like criminal justice reform, the drug war, healthcare, education, climate, many more topics. So can you tell us what the book is about and what you're trying to achieve? Sure. The the motivation behind the book was a problem that I have encountered when talking with people about libertarianism or or hearing non-libertarians talk about libertarian ideas. And namely, that's that libertarianism as, as a political philosophy is to a great extent a whole series of negative statements. It's, you know, government is doing this and it shouldn't be. People want to exercise this particular power over other people and they shouldn't. And so it's a lot of a lot of libertarian policy then is we need to stop doing X, Y, and Z. The the problem with that from a rhetorical standpoint is when, say, government action has been the thing that's been doing X, Y, and Z for years or decades or generations, and in the abstract, those things like government's been providing education, government's been providing health care, government's been providing certain kinds of criminal justice solutions – and those things in the abstract are valuable. Like people want education, they want healthcare, they want criminal justice, and so on. Um, when all when what you're saying is government should stop doing this and this and this, they even if they're kind of on board with like the rights based arguments that you know government is violating rights when it does this or it's inefficient or so on. At the back of the mind is this like well, but 
what's the alternative? Like, yes, I understand that that you're worried about rights violations, but if the result is I'm not going to have education for my children, you know, maybe I'm willing to put up with some rights violations for that. And and so what I wanted to do was advance a positive vision because I'm a libertarian. I care about, I mean, I care about rights. I care about like those kinds of the, the negative side, the, you know, there are restrictions, there are things that you can't do to other people if we respect their dignity and autonomy, and we ought to respect their dignity and autonomy. Mm -hmm. That's very important to me. But the reason that I decided to make a career out of this stuff is because I care deeply about making the world a better place. And I think that the world could be a radically better place than it is now. Um, And I happen to think that Libertarian ideas and libertarian policies are the way we get to that radically better world. But I wanted a book that that showed that to people, that optimistic side that said it's not just about saying government stop doing these things. It's about saying, look, if we stop government from doing these things and instead allow individuals to exercise their their own creativity in these areas – we will get these things that we wanted, education, healthcare, so on, but in this radically better way. And so I wanted a book that provided concrete visions of that, that didn't just say, look, if we get government out of healthcare, healthcare will be higher quality and lower cost, because that's that's kind of abstract. What I wanted to say was, here's how healthcare might operate in a free market system. And and it's the picture that we're painting isn't just like a better way to do healthcare, but it's an inspiring vision of how good healthcare could be. So that was the goal with the book is to is to bring together what I hope are inspiring visions of what a libertarian world might look like in order to get people thinking like that's the kind of world that's worth pursuing. And it's it's different from a lot of policy books or even just policy papers or essays, you get completely like transported into a different place, like a new future America. It's I I really liked it. I don't know. I but I'm glad to hear that. I think I'm gonna be giving it to a lot of people because I think it's it's important. And that kind of leads me to want what I wanted to talk about next, which continues this theme is the foreword of the book that was written by David Bowes, who's a vice president of Cato Institute. He talks about the challenge given to us by Hayek, the economist. You definitely know who that is. <laughs> he says, quote, we, we must make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. What we lack is a liberal utopia, a program which neither seems a mere defense of things as they are, nor a diluted kind of socialism, but a truly liberal radicalism which does not spare the susceptibilities of the mighty, which is not too severely practical, which does not confine itself to what appears today as politically possible, end quote. And in this book, I feel like you've taken on Hayek's challenge. So, I mean, at least I kind of see it as like a first step towards kind of opening people's minds to see what is possible. So, I don't know, do you view it as a first step? And then if you see it as a first step or if you don't, like what what next? I think it is it is certainly a step, and that that degree of call it like a liberal utopianism does motivate the book. And it was actually it was one of the things that we talked about as we were conceptualizing the book and and working through the chapters was does a book like this get you accused of being too utopian? That we're, you know, we're describing this Panglossian, impossible worlds, and and all that it demonstrates is that libertarianism is, you know, this kind of naive, like we can make everything perfect view um, that doesn't engage in like the here and now. And I wanted, on the one hand, to acknowledge that concern, um, but on the other hand, to to kind of aim past it to say, like, so when I when I asked colleagues, when I, I wrote up a little thing that I gave to my colleagues that was, you know, here's what I'm looking for in the chapters that I'd like you to write. Um, one of the things that I said is, imagine that you 
don't have to worry about political possibilities right now. You don't have to worry about like could could a bill doing these things make its way through Congress? Like those are very important things for Cato scholars to worry about in their day jobs, but this was, you know, this was the projecting forward. And so I said, you know, if you could imagine that you can wave your magic wand and any changes to public policy that you would like to be made can be made without friction. Um what would the world look like? And and this raised so on the one hand what this did is i think it presents even if the visions that it presents are ultimately unattainable because of political friction or or unattainable in the short term or near term um they still they give us a direction to aim at right like they're like things could be this good and it might take us a long time to get there and we might never get quite there but each step in that direction is going to be a step in the right direction it's going to be an improvement and having these very clear visions of the right direction make finding that right direction when we're picking you know realistic policy changes we can make in the here and now it makes finding that direction easier it gives us somewhere to aim at you know because if you don't have the clarity of the vision um it's it's similar to like if you're talking about you know how could we be more moral um we might say like we can imagine like a perfect moral being like a moral saint and we might say none of us can ever be moral saints but having an idea of a moral saint makes it easier to figure out which direction we should be going and improving to the extent that we can um mm-hmm. and there was there was that but there's also there's also a hayekian side to it there's a hayekian concern um in that so a someone who wants to advocate state action in an area like let's let's take healthcare and the healthcare debates um a a person who wants single payer healthcare the story that they can tell to potential voters is if you vote for me i will pass a law that will say you receive healthcare of the following kinds at the following locations at this cost or at no cost like you can give this very concrete like this is what this i will vote the following world into being um a a libertarian or a hayekian or someone who believes in markets and localized knowledge and allowing people to act on localized knowledge and so believes in decentralization the story that they tell is if you vote for me i will strip away the the rules and regulations that are preventing those things the localized knowledge the decentralization the markets from getting to work um and they will come up with solutions that will be better but i can't i can't tell you what those solutions like exactly what those solutions will look like with any with like a high degree of certainty because if i could like i would be rich right like that's what that's the role of entrepreneurs is to figure out things that like i don't know and you don't know and no one knew until they tried it um and so there was also a slight it, it, when you're reading the chapters there was a problem of can we actually predict with like certainty and with a high degree of concreteness what the libertarian future will look like and so these are i guess it's important to see these chapters not as this is absolutely what libertopia would look like and in fact that some of the authors disagree with each other on what it might look like um but instead these are possible ways it might turn out and and while they might not be exactly right in all their contours um the authors i and the authors and my co-editor and the authors of the book um are pretty confident that however it turns out it will be at least as good and at least as appealing as the vision that's in that book but if we if we were offering like this is exactly how the future would turn out then we fall prey to like the planner's conceit that Hayek is pushing so hard against I mean I can definitely see the challenge in that I mean trying to think about the future even if you don't know if it's certain like i i don't know i don't think i'd be able to write a chapter of your book i mean you know like if someone was like do this i i don't know if i could honestly because i have no idea what the future is going to look like i have no idea even like if that's 
even if it's possible, I, I don't know. I don't know. But, um, what I kind of want to know what I've been thinking about, what I thought about as I was reading this and as I was thinking that I had no idea how anyone could possibly think so outside of the box. And so like, I'm always very optimistic, but it's difficult to try to even pin down one idea to pin down the vision, which was done perfectly in your book. But, um, I mean, without giving names, how hard was it for your colleagues, for the people who wrote the chapters to embrace the vision and to describe what this world would look like? I think it was a different degree of challenge for different authors. Um, some of them, you can tell, were waiting a long time to get an opportunity to write a chapter like this. Um, I'm, I'm thinking like, Alex Narasta's chapter on immigration, where he does a alternate history of the United States if the Supreme Court had made a different decision earlier in our history to dramatically liberalize immigration. And then he he follows through how what the world might look like from that. And he wrote that chapter fast enough that I am relatively certain that he had already thought of this entire elaborate alternate history before I even envisioned the book. And he was just like, finally, you know, an excuse <laughs> to write my like Harry Turtle Dove style chapter. Um, and so there were, there were a number like that. Uh, there were some colleagues who it was more of like the shift from thinking about here and now policy change to envisioning, you know, down the road, how those policy changes would concretely affect the world was more of a challenge because that's not, that's not the way that like, that's not the way that most of the stuff they write is, right? The stuff that we write, the policy analysis that we write at Cato are, here is a law that Congress has that ought to be changed in such and such a way for the following reasons, or here's a new law that ought to be introduced, or here's the problem with existing regulations or whatever. But it is this very much like within, you know, closer to the Overton window thinking and and just thinking about the here and now, which is good. That's like because that's how you get policymakers to listen to you about policy change. It's not to, you know, tell them we're going to just like radically change everything because they won't they won't pay attention to that. And so for some of my colleagues, it was it was harder to get into the mindset of, you know, having that magic wand and and kind of picturing the perfect world. I think too, some of the areas are easier to write that sort of thing, or at least to give like a a kind of fun sci-fi scenario than others. Um, so, you know, some of the technology chapters, it's like, well, these lend themselves very much to, you know, here's emerging tech and we can see the emerging tech. And now let's imagine the world if we ran with that, like if the barriers, the regulatory barriers to its widespread advancement and use were abandoned, we can come up with, you know, cool scenarios of what that might look like. Others, it's like, you know, the government's doing this stuff and we would have if we stopped if it stopped doing the bad stuff we'd have just we'd have more of what we've already got you know so like free trade is a good example of this like we have a lot of free trade and we know so we can look around and we can see what our lives look like when there's free trade and so then it's the 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 concrete scenario is simply it looks like the world does now except a lot more goods can cross borders and so there's even more specialization in trade and so we're all we're all wealthier um so i think those were those are the kind of axes around which some chapters were easier or more difficult was how much they lend themselves to this speculative scenario making and then also just how much the individual authors were able to step outside of the, you know, immediate policy recommendations that that's our bread and butter. It's, I just still would never have been able to even think of writing some sort of chapter like that. It, I wish I could, <laughs> but I definitely couldn't. 
Um, I think you also need to know your area really well, yeah, which is true. which is one of the reasons that this is an edited volume and not a single author volume. Mm-hmm. Was it as as we're coming up with the idea for the book? It was very clear that like you wanted each one to be written by someone who had been spending their entire career deep in that one specific area of policy because they would know all of those details. Um, and and so if you had a single person try to write the whole thing, it might the, – the scenarios would probably come across as more superficial than I think what we got in the final product. Yeah. I mean I really liked how it varied between like – chapter to chapter it wasn't exactly the same thing each chapter was written kind of differently which Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed I also really liked the cover I don't know like I because my mom's like this is this is a this is a book that that Aaron edited you should you should read it and I was like I was like oh yeah just like get it and then it came and she was like this is it and I was like that book looks so nice like (laughs) If I had no idea what that book was, I would want to read it just because it looks nice. And Don Boudreaux said, and I can quote him on this because I remember talking to him about it. He said, that book is so pretty. I really want to read it. <laughs> that's like, that's awesome. Uh, so, I mean, the cover of the book, I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like it was somewhat purposeful. Like, was it? Or did you just like that? Or what? It, so there was there was a lot of work that went into the cover, um, and not just the like the design of the cover, but also the paper stock of the book, the the textured feel of the cover. I spent um, Eleanor, who heads up our our book production at Cato, gave me lots of samples of paper and cover stock that I, you know, just messed with until I found the one that felt right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wanted this book, and it's similar to the prior edited volume I did with with Grant Babcock called Arguments for Liberty. I wanted the book, and this is this is a personal taste thing, um, to feel like the kind of book that you would pull off the shelf in a hip little used bookstore and and the kind of book that like you'd pull off and see had been, you know, well loved and well read. Um, I wanted I wanted that feel of like timelessness to the design, and in, in part because I think if you the alternative way, especially a book that's like about predicting the future, if we went with like a futuristic cover design, those end up feeling really dated, really quickly. You know, like just look at you know sci fi novel covers from twenty years <laughs> ago, and they all feel dated. Um, so that was so I wanted to avoid that, and so I went with something that had slightly more of an abstract and and retro feel that, that harkened back to the paperbacks, you know, paperbacks from the sixties or seventies that had that kind of that aesthetic because it felt more, it felt more timeless to me. Um, but I've always, for all the books we do at libertarianism.org, I've always, it's been like graphic design is really important to us throughout the project is to, to make these things. You know, you're asking, if you're asking someone to pay for a physical object that they're going to carry around with them or keep in their house. I feel like, I mean, the, the content has to be good, but also, you know, put the effort into making the design look really good because then there's going to be something they're going to want to carry around or want to have. I mean, like for me, my biggest challenge is always hardcover books, any academic book and most idea books, like anything that, is about economics or policy is always hardcover and I cannot stand hardcover books. And so I was just really excited about this one. And also it's just, it fits because it's about policy, but in kind of a removed futuristic way. And it's kind of like an academic book, but in a removed futuristic way. So I feel like it's like perfect. I don't know. It's just a very satisfying book. Um, I, I too don't particularly enjoy reading hardcovers. I just don't f- find like the feel of them in my hand as nice as like a good paperback. So that's why these are, yeah, there there was never any intention of doing a hardcover of these books because I'm I'm less of a fan of them. We also wanted to keep the price low because our our audience is 
younger people and students who don't typically have a huge amount of disposable income. So making people pay extra for a hardcover seemed unnecessary in this case. I mean, I can definitely just tell you that that is 100% right. Like every time I go to the bookstore, I always, if it's a hardcover, I don't care if I want to read the book. I will choose a book that is cheaper that I only kind of want to read because I don't, I don't have that much money. Like I'm, I'm 17. I'm not going to be paying like $30 for a hardcover Mm -hmm. book. Like, you know, I, you got it right on the mark there. I kind of wanted to turn to not only this, but just kind of the future of what this book can do. I mean, so I was reading, well, I read the whole thing, but I kept rereading Clark Neely's chapter because it's especially relevant right now because it's just like the timing is right of when this book came into my life. Like people are using this moment to try to find a way to change the criminal justice system. And even though that's really difficult because all the incentives are lined up to maintain the status quo, he writes about, he uses the magic wand, right? He uses that to talk about what it would look like to create a vision for what it would look like if it was not that way. And I think people in their attempts to make change, everyone has a different idea and kind of it's scattered attempts to to make change, but no one really, while there's like a general goal, there's no specific vision for what we want out of this movement. Right. And I don't know. I just, I thought it was like really good timing and Clark wrote, quote, the goals of a truly just and well-functioning system would be much more modest than those of our present system, and such a system would restore several features that we have largely eliminated, including A, robust protection for substantive and procedural rights, B, strong accountability for those charged with enforcing the laws, and C, high levels of citizen participation in the administration of criminal justice, end quote which is what people seem to want, but it's like the attempts to get there seem kind of scattered because I don't think anyone has come together and like put two and two together and decided that like we need this to get to that point or like tried to kind of go backwards. This is what we want. How do we get there in like a specific way. I don't know. I mean, I know some people have, but like, it just seems like looking on social media, people are kind of all over the place. So can you talk about how like this book could be an agent of change and kind of uniting people in a similar vision? I think the, to the extent that the, the visions that are in the book, the, the visions of each of the policy areas is inspiring, which was, as I said, our, our hope in you know, writing the book or in in editing the book, um, they can, each one can give something to rally around. And, and I do think that having a, an inspiring vision to rally around can be very powerful in a way that simply having a, like a negative statement, um, like we want to stop this thing or, or we want the world better. Um, but the only idea we have about that is like to stop the following three things that we think are bad in it. Um, that, that you can, if you can say, here's, here's an, here's an inspiring vision of the world. It can bring people, it can bring people together around it. And as you said, it can give them then the motivation to try to figure out how to get there. But it's also, it's also something that I think can maintain the, the rally around effect in the way that simple grievances, even when they're, you know, a hundred percent justified grievances about things that absolutely should be stopped immediately, which is the case with, you know, a huge amount of the the criminal justice protests that are happening right now and the racial justice protests that are happening right now. Um, that that having that ongoing vision, you know, I think this is one of the problems like Occupy Wall Street movement um, had had concerns about what 
like things they thought were wrong with the world. And and I think some of those concerns were perfectly justified, some less so, but they were able to get a a lot of energy around protesting those things initially, but as soon as they turned to, okay, well, what do we replace it with? That it it fell apart. You know, it dissipated it dissipated, the the encampments went away mm-hmm. um, because there was this disagreement. And my goal with the book is not to say like this is the only vision worth pursuing. Um, in part because I think there are lots of visions worth pursuing and also for the the reasons we talked about with Hayek, like, you know, we might not be 100% accurate in all of these predictions. Um, but, But rather to inspire people to say like, this is something we can rally around and we can, we can keep working until we've accomplished this, but also to say like, this is a, this is a vision that we can all agree would be better than what we've got now. But, but to encourage other people to come up with alternate versions too. Like, that's what I'd love to see is someone say, no, I think like, in fact, your all of the stuff that you said we ought to do in criminal justice, like the problems that Clark, you've identified with the current criminal justice system are exactly like they're the right, the right problems to identify and the ones that we have to fix. But in fact, in their absence, and if we were freed up to apply our creativity to these solutions, here's an even better way it might turn out. Here's here's an alternative that I think is even more inspiring. Um, and but as long as we share the common goals in it, you know, we're we're aiming like we the kind of criteria by which we're judging the world as better in these visions that we have we have agreement on those. We can we can kind of continue to rally as we update them. Um, but I do think, as you said, I do think having having this concrete vision and saying to someone, you know, because if you if you say the world's pretty bad right now in in all of these ways, um, but and my, you know, and we're going to complain about it and we're going to try to stop some of the bad stuff. I think that 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 doesn't hook as many people or there are lots of people who won't be hooked by that, who would instead be really hooked by or motivated by like here it is. Here's what we think the world could be like. Are you with us in trying to figure out how to make this happen? Um, and and so I think Clark's chapter is is a good example of that because it on the one hand it does identify very clearly the real problems we have in the criminal justice system right now, and and says these are the things that like we absolutely must change. But at the same time, it it answers that question of look if we get rid of all these things like yes police misconduct might be bad and yes, police violence. But like, if we got rid of all of that, how would we have a criminal justice system? It also answers that question says, here's the humane and just criminal justice system we could have instead. Are you with me on this? And, and I believe, I certainly hope, but I believe that a lot of people who read this book, even if they're not, you know, don't think of themselves as libertarians, will see maybe not all of the visions in this, but, you know, at least a number of them will really speak to them and say, yes, that's exactly the kind of world that I would like to achieve. I'd like to figure out how to get us there. I'm kind of curious about this. Do you have a favorite chapter or passage in the book? That's a hard question to answer (laughs) without, you know, I love them all. And all of my colleagues are great and turned in fantastic chapters. Um, but I think the ones that I enjoy the most, and this is just a taste thing, mm-hmm. are the ones that played the most with the format. Um, that so I I really like um, I like Alex's a lot because it is this fun alternate history that is is very detailed and is just interesting in and of itself, even if you're not you know not particularly interested in like libertarianism or public policy or whatever. It's a fun alternate history. Similarly, uh, my colleague Trevor Burris, his chapter on the war on drugs takes kind of a similar approach. It's not an alternate history, but it is, it's a, a attempt to map out what the coming decades might look like if we abandoned the war on drugs and, and does it in this, this very speculative, like describing future scenario sort of way, which makes it again, 
a lot of fun. Or uh, my colleague Will Duffield's chapter, which tries to describe, you know, in a in a world where technology allowed for really robust freedom of digital expression, what would a typical, you know, what might a typical day look like? Um, those those are the ones that just from my you know kid who grew up reading a lot of science fiction tastes were were probably the most fun, um, but. But I think I think I mean all of the chapters like it's it's also just going to depend on if you have you know we cover we cover a lot of policy areas and people have the policy areas that matter most to them um, and so I think that the answer to you know which are the best chapters is going to vary too a lot based on like the ones that are on policy areas that matter most to you you're probably going to find the the most compelling but yeah for me it was the ones that that took the the framework that Paul and I articulated for a chapter and really went with it in, in their own direction. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something in this book for everyone that, cause there's so much, there's so many chapters. There's even within the chapters, there's so many like different parts. Like, I don't know. I think everyone can find something that they even partially agree with or that they could like maybe see as a possible future that they'd like in this book, which is so cool. So to wrap up, I wanted to ask you, what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? I've changed my position on a lot of things, um, lots of political issues, lots of economic issues. Um, but the one that I think as, as I was thinking back, trying to figure out the, the answer I would give on this, um, the one that is the starkest in my mind is changing my view on religious faith. Um, that in, when I was particularly when I was in college, I was a very hardcore, like new atheist sort. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote quite a lot of essays about the obviousness of atheism and how just, you know, nonsense and bad um, religious belief was and how we would be better off if we got rid of it and so on. Um, and I have... So I was I was deeply into that set of ideas. I have changed quite a lot in that regard over the years, not in not in abandoning the underlying atheism. I haven't I haven't come to believe that like the metaphysical claims are are correct, but in my assessment of the place of faith and spirituality in the world and the value of it to the individual, um, and and this culminated in over the last you know four or five years ago, kind of deciding that I was um, that I was going to start calling myself a Buddhist and and embracing embracing that. Um, but I think that's the thing. Like I've changed my views on a lot of stuff, but that's the one where when I look back at it, I look back at what I used to believe and the way that I used to think about things um, to where I am now. There is – there's the biggest contrast and the most like regret for how certain I was and how much that certainty cut off a, a field of human experience and kind of an understanding of – the the ideas of other people that that I yeah that I regret now once again I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight I'd also like to thank you for listening to the great antidote podcast it means a lot the great antidote is sound engineered by rich goyette if you have any questions, any guests, or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at greatantidote at libertyfund.org. Thank you.